Well, welcome to this quiz on the cardiovascular system. And in this talk, we're going to be focusing on the heart and the major vessels. And it's part quiz and it's part discussion as well, this sort of um, this format. So what we'll have is we'll have a slide that's got a question on it. If you want to spend time on that question, just pause that slide before we go on to the next slide, which will have the answer and some explanation of that answer. A major role of the cardiovascular system that's responsible for the circulation of the blood around the body is to transport oxygen around the body to all the metabolizing cells in the body, which is basically all of the cells in the body that need oxygen to facilitate metabolic processes. So it's good to work out where there's different levels of oxygenation in the blood. So this first question is which artery carries deoxygenated blood remember an artery is any vessel that carries blood away from the heart so here we see the pulmonary artery colored in because that's the answer now because it's carrying relatively deoxygenated blood the convention is to make it a, a blue color now, if people do become very deoxygenated, they can become cyanosed, which is a blue colour. But the blood in the pulmonary artery is still red. But it's not as bright red as the blood that's just been oxygenated. It's a darker red colour. And this is because the blood is partly deoxygenated. It has a greater concentration of deoxyhemoglobin as opposed to oxyhemoglobin, giving it this darker red colour. Now, in you at the moment, in health, the blood that's oxygenated is probably going to be around about a 98, 99% oxygen, percent saturated with oxygen. Whereas the blood in the pulmonary artery, in you at the moment, is probably going to be about 75% saturated with oxygen. So there's still a lot of oxygen in it. There's just relatively less oxygen than in the fully oxygenated blood. So it's reasonable to say that the pulmonary artery contains relatively deoxygenated blood. And if you look at the arrows on this screen, that makes perfect sense because this blood is being carried to the lungs. And it's the lungs that are responsible for the oxygenation of this partly deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary artery. An artery is any vessel carrying blood away from the heart. Pulmonary means to do with lungs. So the pulmonary artery is carrying blood from the heart to the lungs. What actually happens is one pulmonary artery leaves the right ventricle, as we can see there. Then it quickly divides into two because one branch goes to each lung. And then that rapidly divides into the smaller pulmonary arteries and ultimately into the pulmonary arterioles that take blood into the pulmonary capillaries where the gaseous exchange takes place. So which vein carries oxygenated blood? A vein is any vessel taking blood towards the heart. And as we've said, we're talking about relative degrees of oxygenation when we're talking about the healthy circulatory system. So in which vein is the blood highly oxygenated? Probably about 97, 98% oxygen. So the blood is oxygenated in the pulmonary capillaries. That blood drains into pulmonary venules. The pulmonary venules drain into progressively larger veins. And those veins drain into the four large pulmonary veins. But for diagrammatic purposes here, we've just drawn one because this shows the nature of the self-contained circulatory system. And we've followed the convention here by making the highly oxygenated blood that's high in oxyhemoglobin bright red. And this blood is in fact brighter red than the dark red blood that went to the lungs in the first place. So the answer is the pulmonary vein. So this diagram is showing the oxygenation of the blood in the lungs. So we see the pulmonary artery, the blood arriving just after the pulmonary artery when the blood first goes into the lungs that that's still dark blue that's still deoxygenated blood 
But as we go through the lungs, represented by this shape, as we go through the lungs, the amount of deoxygenated blood decreases. And also as we go through the lungs, you can see the amount of bright red, highly oxygenated blood is increasing. It increases all the way through the lungs until the blood leaves the lungs via the pulmonary venous system when it's highly oxygenated. And at the same time that the blood is taking up the oxygen, it is giving out the carbon dioxide. So the blood arriving in the pulmonary artery is going to be relatively high in carbon dioxide. That's going to give that carbon dioxide out through the pulmonary capillary membranes into the alveolar air spaces, explaining why we breathe out more carbon dioxide than we breathe in. So there's this whole process of gaseous exchange going on in the lungs. Oxygen going from the air in the lungs into the blood. Carbon dioxide going from the blood into the air in the lungs prior to exhalation. Now blood circulates through the systemic capillaries. And systemic means to do with the systems of the body. So this will include all parts of the body apart from the lungs. So it will include your brain and your liver and your feet. And once the blood has been through the systemic capillaries, it's drained in systemic venules. They drain into systemically larger veins. And ultimately these larger veins drain into the inferior and superior vena cava the two largest veins in the body, the inferior vena cava draining blood from the bottom half of the body, the superior vena cava draining blood from the top half of the body. So given that information, is the blood in the vena cava relatively high or low in oxyhemoglobin? Is it highly oxygenated blood or is it partly deoxygenated blood? So as the blood goes through the capillaries of the body, it's going to give up some of the oxygen it's containing, and that's going to go into the body tissues for metabolic processes. So that means that the blood draining in the systemic veins is going to be partly deoxygenated blood. The oxygen saturations in it are going to be down about 25%, and it's probably going to be around about 75% saturated. And as we can see, that's being carried back to the right side of the heart. And this diagram is illustrating the process of gaseous exchange in the tissues of the body, in the systemic circulation. So we see that the aorta is de delivering highly oxygenated blood into the systemic arteries. As the blood goes through the body, it's becoming there's progressively less of this highly oxygenated blood the red line is becoming further apart. But also as we go through the body, the deoxygenated blood starts to increase in concentration. As we go through a particular capillary bed where this gaseous exchange process is taking place until the point where the blood leaves the body, enters the systemic veins, which are going to drain into the vena cava, we see that the blood is largely deoxygenated at this point, or at least deoxygenated relative to what it was in the aorta and the systemic arterial system. And in addition to a reduction in the amount of oxygen in the blood as the blood goes through the systemic circulation, there's going to be an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide generated by metabolic processes in the tissues of the body, in the individual cells, is going to diffuse from the cells into the tissue fluid and into the blood, thereby the concentration of carbon dioxide is going to increase. So there's going to be relatively low concentrations of carbon dioxide in the aorta and in the systemic arteries but a relatively higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the veins and consequently in the inferior and superior vena cava. So there are four chambers within the heart. The atria at the top and the ventricles at the bottom. 
which chamber of the heart discharges or pumps blood into the systemic circulation. That is to take the blood round all the tissues of the body except the lungs. So the chamber coloured in there is the left ventricle. It is the left side of the heart that is the body pump. It is the left ventricle that discharges blood into the aorta. It is the aorta that perfuses all of the systemic arteries in the body. So it's the left ventricle that's pumping blood into the systemic circulation. So remember, the left side of the heart is the body pump, pumping blood to the body. So this next question is a perfectly logical follow on from the previous question. Which chamber of the heart discharges blood into the pulmonary circulation? That is, which chamber of the heart is pumping blood to the lungs? Well, here we see the right ventricle coloured in because it's the right ventricle that is pumping blood to the lungs. It is the right ventricle which is discharging blood into the pulmonary circulation. The right side of the heart is the lung pump. Left side of the heart, body pump. Right side, side of the heart, lung pump. Just memorise that. And of course, when we're looking at this heart, we're looking at someone else's. So when you're looking at someone else face on, the right side is looking at your left hand side. You always look at someone else's in anatomy. The left side is your right hand side. So the right ventricle is always at the left hand side of the page and the left ventricle is always at the right hand side of the page because you're always looking at someone else's. And if you forget, just look at someone face on and think what is right and left for them and that will give you the correct anatomical description of whatever part of anatomy you are considering. So which chamber of the heart receives blood from the systemic circulation? Which chamber of the heart is receiving blood from the body? And I'll give you a clue here. The atria are the receiving chambers and the ventricles are the pumping chambers. So here we see the right atrium coloured in because that's the answer. It's the right atrium that is receiving blood from the inferior and superior vena cava and they are the two large veins draining the body. So it's the right atrium that is receiving blood from the systemic body circulation. And it's blue because it's partly deoxygenated blood. Well, hopefully this is starting to make sense now and you'll be able to see which chamber of the heart receives blood from the lungs. Which chamber of the heart is receiving blood from the pulmonary veins. So the left atrium is the receiving chamber for the pulmonary circulation. And we've drawn this in bright red because the blood is going to be highly oxygenated as it returns from the lungs to the left atrium. So given the large vessels that you can see in this diagram, in which vessel is the blood pressure highest? The blood pressure is the pressure of the blood against the walls of the vessels in which that blood is contained. Well, it's not very far from the heart to the lungs, so the pressure in the pulmonary artery doesn't need to be very high. Um, typically, you might find a blood pressure of about 18, no, 18 to 25 as being the systolic pressure and uh, 8 to 15 as being the diastolic pressure. The systolic pressure is when the heart is contracting, the diastolic pressure is when it's uh, relaxing. So if we say a mean arterial pressure in the pulmonary artery of about 9 to 18 millimetres of mercury. Slightly high during exercise. But if we say 9 to 18 millimetres of mercury mean arterial blood pressure in the pulmonary artery, that's not too far out. Uh, the, the pressure in the vena cava in the central veins is about 2 to 6 millimetres of mercury maybe slightly higher in the pulmonary veins, around about 4 to 12 millimetres of mercury. But it's way higher in the aorta. Um, during the contraction of the left ventricle, the blood pressure is probably going to be about 120, and during relaxation it's going to be about uh, 
about 80. But if you want to find that out, you can simply take your own blood pressure. But it's in the systemic arteries that the blood pressure is definitely highest. So the aorta is clearly the answer to this question. Well, given that we know that the pressure in the aorta is the highest of the blood vessels, you should be able to work out which ventricle is the most powerful. Is it going to be the right ventricle, the lung pump, or is it going to be the left ventricle, the body pump? Well, because it's the left ventricle that's generating the systemic arterial higher pressures, it's not surprising that the left ventricle is the most powerful. But what is it that makes the left ventricle the most powerful pumping chamber of the heart? Well, the middle layer of the wall of the heart is all the myocardium. The myocardium is the contractile muscle of the heart. And the left ventricular myocardium is significantly thicker than the right ventricular myocardium. So it is the thick muscular left ventricular wall that gives the left ventricle its greater pumping capacity able to generate higher blood pressures. And we notice that the left ventricle here is in the left wall of the heart and it's also in the bit in the middle, the cardiac septum that also contributes towards left ventricular pumping ability. Which ventricle discharges most blood in a five minute period? Is it the right ventricle or is it the left ventricle? Now you might want to pause and have a think about this because I'm not going to give you any clues. Well, the answer is that the volumes of blood in any five minute period discharged by both chambers of the heart is absolutely identical. It's the same. So really it's a bit of a silly question or a trick question. But it raises some very important physiology. Because if you think about it, if the left ventricle was pumping out more blood than the right, then the systemic circulation would become too full of blood and the pulmonary circulation would become too empty. Or conversely, if the right ventricle was pumping out more blood than the left ventricle, the pulmonary circulation would fill with blood and the systemic circulation would gradually empty. So it has to be absolutely identical. And this is very impressive physiology. And it's controlled by what is usually called Starling's law of the heart, or sometimes the Frank Starling reflex. Otto Frank was a German physiologist, Ernest Starling was an English physiologist. So they're actually pumping out the same amount because Starling's law of the heart says that the strength of contraction of the heart or of the ventricles is proportional to the filling. So if the ventricle fills a lot, there's a stronger contraction to eject more blood. If the ventricle doesn't fill as much, for example, during rest, then there's a, the, because the ventricular wall doesn't stretch as much, it doesn't contract as powerfully. And uh, that mechanism works very precisely to ensure that the output of the right and the left ventricle is, is identical over periods of time. Now we're moving on to think about the valves of the heart. Now the right atrioventricular valve, that is the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle, is the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps that open and shut, three leaves. And here we see in figure one that is uh, the valve closed. Whereas the left atrioventricular valve, that is the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, is a, a bicuspid valve. It has two cusps. And again, in figure two here, we see the cusps closed, indicating that the valve is in the closed position. And closure of these valves is so important that we, the valves are connected to these tendinous cords, what used to be called the cordi tendini, the tendinous cords. And they're attached to papillary muscles that embed into the ventricular myocardial wall. And when the valves close, these papillary muscles contract and pull tight on the tendinous cords to make sure that the valves are indeed fully closed. Because we don't want regurgitation from the ventricles into the atria during 
systolic contraction of the ventricles. So which valve prevents reflux back into the right atrium is the question. So a valve is a structure to ensure one way flow of blood. We want the blood to go from the right atrium through into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, there's no point pumping blood back into the right atrium because it's just come from there. We want the blood to be pumped out into the pulmonary artery. So this arrow on the diagram is the physiological direction. If the blood were to go in the other direction from the ventricle back to the atrium, that would be reflux. And it is the closure of this tricuspid valve that prevents reflux of blood in a retrograde direction from the ventricle to the atria, ensuring that in health the blood only flows in this physiological direction from the atrium to the ventricle and out into the arterial system. So following on from this, which valve prevents reflux back into the left atrium? Well, again, the red arrow in this diagram is showing the physiological direction of the blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. If the bicuspid valve, that is the mitral valve, did not fully close, then blood would reflux from the left ventricle back into the left atrium, which is abnormal. So it's the mitral valve, which is the left atrioventricular valve, ensuring one way flow of blood from the left atria to the left ventricle. Now, once the blood's been ejected from the left ventricle into the aorta, we don't want the blood to reflux back from the aorta back into the left ventricle. Again, that would be a, a reflux situation. We only want the blood to go from the left ventricle to the aorta and then on into the circulatory system. So which valve prevents reflux from the aorta back into the left ventricle? Well, this big red arrow is showing the physiological direction of blood going from the left ventricle into the aorta. If it were to go the other way, that would be reflux and that would be abnormal. And as you can see from the diagram, that's the aortic valve or the aortic arterial valve. And these are also called sometimes uh, semilunar valves because they're supposed to look like half moons, some anatomists used to think. And uh, the aortic valve or the aortic semilunar valve has got three cusps. It's a form of tricuspid valve, but it's, a, it's an arterial valve and it prevents this reflux from the aorta back into the left ventricle. So the logical follow on and the last question in this particular quiz, which valve prevents reflux from the pulmonary artery back into the right ventricle? The arrow here is again showing the physiological direction from the right ventricle through to the pulmonary artery. And if the blood were to go the other way, that would be regurgitation or reflux. So the answer is the pulmonary semilunar valve or the pulmonary arterial valve.